Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. Good evening, my name is Ian Blackburn. I'll be the host tonight of our Malbec and Empanada tasting. We're going to be starting in just a second. But for those of you um, tuning in on Facebook, uh, we run the wine operations for merchantofwine.com where all of our Zoom Into Wine programs are hosted. Uh, Zoom Into Wine is our way of sending wine to your home so that you can taste with us and ask a lot of questions. And we can just enjoy a wine community here on Zoom from the luxury of your own home. Yeah, my name is Ian Blackburn. I've been a wine educator for over 25 years here in Los Angeles. I operate uh, learnaboutwine.com, which we are very busy getting uh, reprogrammed and beefed up for the next uh, phase of our lives. And um, we're very excited to have a really nice um, group of people tonight joining us, wines in the glass. And hopefully you guys were able to take advantage of the empanada program where we were delivering to be baked empanadas from our friends at World Empanadas. We wanna thank them for their efforts. Uh, they are delicious and hopefully you got a chance to bake those off and enjoy them with your, with your uh, wines tonight. Uh, World Empanadas does a really good job. They have a pretty extensive menu and um, it's a real easy jaunt to get over there, grab some. If you ever have a party, you'd be a surprise what a big hit. A giant plate full of empanadas will be at a big uh, gathering, casual gathering, and it keeps it real easy and quite affordable. Um, these are handmade and uh, they do it really well. These are, are pretty good in size as well. Um, I've seen empanadas in different uh, renditions. I've even been to Mendoza and had some authentic uh, empanadas uh, made up for us. Uh, I think uh, World does a really good job of making it really authentic. So enjoy that. Some of you may have also got a little bit of sauce to go with those. Uh, they do their spin on the chimichurri and other types of sauces that are prevalent with the dish. But uh, <clears throat> Malbec can go with so many different things. And Malbec is really, I think, a little under uh, served, uh, under uh, thought of, underappreciated is maybe a, the right term. Um, it's, it's really a beautiful wine and it over delivers. And I think tonight's showing is gonna help us uh, focus in on that. So let's begin with our presentation on Malbec. So Malbec is the name of the grape variety, and Malbec got its start in the south of France. Um, it is one of the Bordeaux five grape varieties. When people ask you what are the five grapes of Bordeaux, you know, everyone thinks of Merlot and Cabernet and Cabernet Franc. You might remember Petit Verdot, but Malbec is, uh, is a grape that is barely planted in Bordeaux. It's, it's, it's definitely there. But it's a little bit more significant just south of Bordeaux. And if you follow the Giron a little bit further south, which is what they used to have to do in the olden days when Bordeaux ran out of wine, you just kept going down the river to a town called Cahors. And Cahors makes the Malbec wine, a 100% a, a Malbec wine. And <clears throat> it is also known as Cote uh, or Black. It is the black grape, and it's this big, dark, tannic red wine from this rustic little town at Cahors. And they can be quite charming. They are typically quite affordable. If you travel anywhere in Paris or France, you're probably gonna have a glass of Cahors offered to you as like the house wine at a little corner bistro. Um, it's, it's fairly, uh, easy to pair with different beef dishes and just quite satisfying on its own. But the French version tends to be a little hardcore, tannic and rustic. And it wasn't until uh, 1990s that uh, a winemaker from Napa Valley was hired by the Katana family to come down and, and consult. And he told the Katanas, you know, I could help you make better Cabernet. This is what they want him to do. Paul Hobbs is the winemaker, by the way. And he was, he was hired to come down and help the Katana family uh, basically make world-class Cab. And he looked him straight in the face and said, I, I could help you make better Cabernet, 
but you're going to be going into a storm of, you know, Bordeaux and Napa and other places in the world. Chile's making great Cabernet and Argentina or uh, Australia. Um, <clears throat> there's even some beautiful stuff out of Washington. He just reminded them how competitive Cabernet could be. And he, and he also said no one is focused on Malbec and nor has the material that you guys have. And he just kind of laid it out there and said, you guys should be focused on Malbec. And it was in 1994. By 2012, it was their largest export at around 12 million cases, which is, sounds like a lot, but it's, it's uh, from going from nothing to 12 million, that is a lot. But it is, uh, it is still a relatively conservative amount of wine being made for the wine world. And it kind of always over delivers. There's this great value in it. But <clears throat> what I want to focus on are the better wines. And I want to see uh, Argentina have a future with Malbec too. And if they can't charge over $15 a bottle for their Malbec, they're going to fail. So they're really trying to use this as part of their formula of building their wine industry. A lot of French, a lot of Italians moved you know, some of their investments to uh, Mendoza and other parts of Argentina because they see the opportunity. But there's also some struggles. You know, the currency has been under a lot of pressure, the economy, and uh, with COVID and everything else and the lack of travel, um, certainly Argentina has suffered uh, in regards to its wine industry. But Malbec is a beautiful wine and tonight we're gonna taste three fantastic versions each of them getting nice press and accolades. I just numbered the jars for you. I would love for you to taste through all three and kind of pick which ones you like before I tell you which one is which. And then we can talk about value um, in, the, in the glass. But just taking a look at the grape as a, uh, in overall, it's typically lower in acid, but it's a really full bodied grape. And it, we tend to focus on flavors like plum skin. There's a good amount of tannin, depending on uh, the vintage. Sometimes the tannins can be a little bit more severe. And uh, and they do tend to make it in a slightly riper style, uh, which may be sometimes referred to as jammy. But uh, um, depending on where it's from, those tannins will kind of bring it back to that ultra bone dry type of character in Kaor. Um, but today we're gonna taste wine uh, from Argentina, um, from Mendoza, uh, and we're also tasting one version from the Napa Valley, which was the inspiration of this tasting. Over the last year, I've had the pleasure of tasting uh, multiple really beautiful Malbecs from the state of California, and I never really thought, you know, Argentina's doing it so well, why would California try? And um, how good can we make it? I, I, I see a couple of versions on in the press that get some good scores up in Napa and Sonoma. One really uh, up and coming brand up in Alexander Valley just got 100 points for their $200 Malbec. And I, I said, you know, I just don't know what the audience size is for that. But I'm sure if you get 100 points, that audience gets a little bit bigger in a hurry. But uh, what, you know, Argentina certainly had uh, some really nice growth that grew hard and fast, but then it kind of hit a tipping point that I became very concerned about, where I saw almost every wine fighting for a particular price point. And in the American market, that price point is $10 or $9.95. And if you, you know, got to keep your price at that $9.95 in the grocery store, you're just gonna to continue to dilute the wine and turn it into something that's not very flavorful or, or high quality. And uh, that's what happened with Merlot. And Merlot uh, suffered a terrible fate and we're just building back the Merlot business right now in this country. Malbec needs to try a little harder and uh, make some better wines and that's what we're focused on today. Here's a map of France showing you where at that Caor region, approximately, it's a pretty bad map to be honest, but Caor is uh, relatively close to Bordeaux. And here's some uh, Malbec varietal growing in the vineyard. Uh, 
really thick skin black grape variety is often used for its color in a place like Bordeaux. They will just get this saturated color from the skins, those thick skins. But again, we are seeing it in a couple of different places and today we're gonna to taste a wine that's from some of the hills of the Napa Valley. And so one of the three wines that you have is a Napa Valley Malbec. And it's called Elira. I'm not gonna tell you which one it is yet, but we'll just start by talking about Elira. It is, uh, it is this, uh, the goal of this brand is to bring about some really good value uh, focused on Napa Valley, but you know, to avoid the pitfalls of, of another $100, $125 bottle of wine, this wine is really trying to find, uh, you know, and Malbec is not as expensive of a grape variety to, to, to uh, pick in the Napa Valley. You, you could pay easily uh, $10,000 a ton for Cabernet, but you might be able to get some really good Malbec in that $4,000 a ton range. And that's what this uh, brand is focused on, is a little lower cost of fruit and delivering a good value in the bottle. Napa Valley is surrounded, it's like a bowl surrounded by mountains, uh, with uh, mountains being on all corners. And really what the Napa Valley, the valley floor is, is a collection of soils that have eroded off of those volcanic hilltops, mountaintops and uh, it's created a really amazing strata of soils, one of the most complex soil stratas in the, in the world. And uh, that's why I can, I, another reason why I can say Napa Valley is probably making some of the best wine in the world today. Um, and the, the results are continuing to, you know, this is the tail that's wagging the dog. Uh, Napa Valley is a teeny wine region, one eighth of the size of Bordeaux it makes a total of 4% of the wine in California. When I ask people all the time, how much wine comes from the Napa Valley? If you added up all the wine in California, and what, what do you think comes from the Napa Valley? Most people think it's like 50% of our wine. It's 4% of our wine. It's a teeny appellation, but really high quality. And uh, it's the one appellation that people can identify. And when people see California on the label of a bottle of wine, they often think, oh, that must be from Napa Valley. That is not the case. Anything that says California on the, on the bottle is probably 0% Napa Valley and just hoping that you'll misplace it. Anna Monticelli is our winemaker for Elara. And uh, it is uh, her and her husband. And they're quite a hardworking team. They have a number of different projects. I actually have another one of her wines in my store and I'm really taken by it. When people ask me one of my favorite Napa Valley Cabernets under 50 bucks on my website, it's Stackhouse. Stackhouse comes in and is on our, in our store for less than $35. And it is just a delicious Napa Valley effort. And this is a winemaker that has worked all over the, the world and has an incredible amount of experience. But here in, in California, worked for CV and uh, assistant winemaker at Bryant Family. And she worked for Philippe Melka. And uh, she just got, got some amazing scores for the brand Pina, which I now also carry the Pina Napa Valley Cabernet that got 95, 96 points. So um, she's really kind of on a roll. And uh, I think you're really gonna enjoy the wine from her today. This is her husband, Mario, and they work on the projects in different ways and have different specialties. And they also um, are involved in a couple of import wines. And he has a quite a nice long experience in winemaking and in the wine business and viticulture as well. So a really good compliment to Anna's strengths. Another one of the wines that we're gonna to taste today is a brand that you may or may not be familiar with called Chicana. This is an ultra biodynamic uh, producer, pretty small in, in total uh, cases made, but they do grow a lot of fruit and they sell a significant amount of their fruit. This uh, brand is getting quite a few accolades and I'm very pleased to be able to own the 2015, which is another very good vintage in Mendoza. 
when we started uh, down this path of creating this vent, we featured another wine that they make, um, the 2017, which got, just got a 97 point review and quickly got swooped up. So I had to go back to the family and find out what other wine they had available for us. And this is a, this is a very small production inside of their small produ production family. This is a um, this is a wine called Finca Anya, and it's a plot of gravel with calcium carbonate in the, in the soil. So it's a really um, unique soil strata, and so they focus the, their efforts on this one particular bottling of this one particular plot. It is certified organic, but they're using biodynamic principles in their winemaking production, and they believe that the future of Mendoza is in biodynamics. You may ask, what is the difference between biodynamic and, uh, and organic? Well, organic typically means, you know, no herbicides or pesticides, and, um, <clears throat> and there's a, a set of rules that are now coming along in each country to help guide what that organic designation means. It's probably the most organized in Europe at this point. In California, we have organized uh, California sustainability programs. And I really love the word sustainable in wine because it measures more than just what type of additives you're using in a vineyard. Um, sustainability measures your inputs and your outputs. It measures your water usage and your waste. And and so they really look for the, the core definition of the word sustainable and is your product sustainable so california certified sustainable is really a huge part of the future but if you really want to go absolutely mental on grape growing you can cross into a new threshold called biodynamic and biodynamic is almost spiritual grape growing one of the things you need to have to be considered biodynamic is you need to have your own ecosystem that means that you have enough land where your neighbor whatever your neighbor is doing doesn't impact your farm so that's a big distinguishing factor that separates organic and biodynamic and sustainable biodynamics really requires its own ecosystem and then you layer in lots of unique things that they do such as winemaking by the the moon's path and uh, you know, lunar cycles. And then you take things like uh, cow horns and fill them with cow manure and different, we call them teas. Um, they are biodynamic treatments and they, are, they use cow manure. They use uh, crystallized cow manure. They plant those horns in the vineyard. They crystallize that manure. They then um, put it into a tea and spray that tea throughout the vineyard to increase the vineyard's resistance to disease and its ability to uh, receive photosynthesis. And if you th think any of the, the, the steps that a biodynamic person takes are a little bit crazy, just look at a biodynamic winemaker in the eye. They probably are a little bit crazy, but they're crazy uh, uh, passionate. And they, th there's a saying in the wine business that really rings true for biodynamics. The most important ingredient in growing good grapes is the sole of the winemaker's foot in the vineyard, meaning lots of winemakers walking down the rows, really taking care of the vines. And that is the secret of biodynamics because it's so hands-on and they are not allowed to use anything in the vineyard that isn't natural, that isn't part of that tea making process and uh and then there's becomes something almost spiritual about it this is based on kind of uh, rudolf steiner and pagan rituals so there's a lot of um, historical uh grape growing i would say uh hmm, spiritual actions i don't know uh, tribal almost type stuff that they do with their uh, biodynamic actions but anyway this vineyard sits at around 3,000 feet in elevation, Chicana we're talking about. And uh, that's the, one of the magical parts of Mendoza. It's high elevation and it's at the foot of the Andes Mountains. 
that are just enormous and create a ton of water with a snow melt. And that water comes down and they just direct it right into the vineyards. Oftentimes the vines don't even have irrigation systems. This one does. Um, this vineyard does use irrigation systems and uh, it is uh, a little bit more efficient that way. They can actually can control their water usage. A little more about Chicana. 300 acres or 121 hectares, about 2.3 acres in a hectare. Definitely going for multiple certifications. And you can see that, you know, there's a lot of weeds and growth and there's probably flowers and mustard and all types of things that they just till back into the soils to feed the soils. There was a time when we thought that this pristine, you know, not even a leaf to fall in your vineyard meant that you were really doing a good job of farming. And that uh, was as, uh, kind of the most severe corrupt uh, mentality for a vine because we were killing the soil. So now they just allow the natural cover crops to feed the soils bring the bugs, the bugs bring the birds, the birds, you know, keep the grapevines flourishing, the bees and everything else, everything's in perfect balance. And it's with these principles that you can really start to farm at higher levels and even potentially increase the age of your vines. You know, in, in viticulture here in California, when we're farming at high levels and we're adding fertilizers and we're we're trying to bolster the crop and provide a lot of water and get get our bottle costs down. We're actually killing the vine. And uh, those vines get replaced after they're about 25 years old. They're basically tired and, and diseased. And by using biodynamics, which is kind of old school, they can maybe even let these vines grow to be 60 to 100 years of age. And this is really a big future statement. And these are all statements made by the winery. Um, biodynamic viticulture explained why is uh, agriculture for um, for the future and they want to really emphasize that it creates a culture of biodynamic farming and it really impacts you know the way you take care of your animals and your own personal life as well and uh, Mendoza it's it's a movement there um, it's not completely universally accepted but it's it's growing as uh, people are looking for wines that have these ethos. The, one of the three wines that we're gonna taste tonight comes from a, another brand called La Posta, and I've been really impressed with this brand's direction. It is another uh, high altitude, 3,600 feet. Their vine age is around 18 years old. This is a, a larger producer. They uh, have multiple vineyard sites that they work with. This is another brand that's owned by the Katana family. And Katana is certainly one of the larger producers in the region by maybe tenfold. They're probably 10 times larger than anybody else. Um, and they have a lot of different partnerships and they make a number of different brands for different price points, etc. This is, this is a little bit of a, a, a story of vineyards that they don't own, but they farm. And so they're basically buying fruit for the La Posta label. Um, and that's what the name of the farmers are on the label. Here's uh, Laura Katana. She's an underachiever. She, uh, she works as an ER doctor in San Francisco, runs the largest winery in uh, Mendoza. And um, her father, Nicholas Katana, they, they're basically a, a driving force and they own multiple successful brands. And I was being sarcastic when I said underachiever. She's incredible. And if you ever see her speak, she'll even make your jaw drop because she is, she's just incredibly intelligent and thought provoking and uh, been right uh, a lot. For the wines at La Posta, Luis Reginado is the winemaker and each of the labels that they make at La Posta has the different family's name on the label because each farm is a little different. All right, so I see a question about the pricing, so we're gonna do that now. And I'm gonna open up the screen and say hello to everybody at the same time. Hope you guys have been able to put a little bit of wine in the glass. Apparently, 
Are you now? <laughs> Marilyn, how you doing? Oh, Ian, it was a disappointing day. My wine refrigerator got lost in transit. Oh, boy. What does that mean? <laughs> it means I ordered it on Amazon and I took the day off work to be here and it didn't, nobody called me to bring it. And then I called Amazon and they said, oh, it's lost in transit. Yeah, there's a guy on the 710 freeway offering uh, wine refrigerator. <laughs> so I'm bummed, but I'm good now that I have my Malbecs. All right, cool. Well, let's make your day better. Uh, Nicole Breeze, you got a little group there? How you yeah, guys we've got a group. Uh, I'm over here. Wait, let me see. Hello. Hi, guys. <laughs> Good to see you again. Good to see you. Too. Good to see you too. We've got Rob here, and then we've got Hi, Lori Rob. and Adam Gadsby on the other side. Hello. 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 Some Americo and some cheeses to go with the Malbec. Far out. You're doing it right <laughs> as usual. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad we could get uh, some. Uh, did you uh, did you do any empanadas today? Yep. Yeah. yeah. They're 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 be heating for a little bit here. Good. 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 Cool. Well, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Lisa Tess, did you get your empanadas okay? I did. I just had some. They were delicious. Oh, good. 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 Oh, All right, Teresa Mackey, did we get you some empanadas too? It did, and I was quite surprised how spicy the potato one is. So oh, yeah. I've been trying to see how that goes against some of the wine. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, you've got a nice suntan, but maybe that's from the spice. <laughs> yeah, exactly, getting a little flush. <laughs> <laughs> I did not do the potato yet, so uh, I'll check that out. I don't remember it being spicy though, but. Uh, <laughs> It's got some red flakes in it, so. All right, that's that's what it takes. That's what it takes. David, how are things in Santa Monica? Everything okay? Yeah, everything's good here. Thank you. I uh, I just got a wine refrigerator yesterday, so maybe they gave me yours by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it was from Amazon. It came on time, and no one stole it. <laughs> wow, I guess I was lucky. I um, actually I had a question uh, for you, Ian. Yeah. Is, is the best temperature 55 degrees? It seems like that's what uh, Google says, but I figure yeah. you're more of an expert. <laughs> sure. Since um, we got you both, both on here, 55 is is absolutely where you should set that thing at. Okay. Um, I will also advise you to make sure that your wine refrigerator is not stored in a room that's really, really hot. Some people put it in the, in the, in the garage. Okay. And it could get too hot in the garage because the garage is not insulated. Right. Um, and the wine refrigerator is only zoned to cool the the wine down 30 degrees from the outside temperature. So if your room is 75, you know, you can easily get inside a 55. But if it's 105, you could <laughs> burn out your, your wine refrigerator. Okay. And uh, it's a pretty good idea to make sure you have a fantastic warranty on that thing. So if Amazon offered one or you can still get it, um, it's great to double up on that warranty and pay a little extra because the most expensive part is the part that burns out pretty fast, the little uh, refrigeration unit. Okay. So, um, it's, 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 uh, it's, you know, that if that refrigerator costs $500 or $1,000 or $1,800, over half of it is the refrigeration unit. Really? Okay. So that's just a couple things to keep in mind. Um, but 55 is where it works the most efficiently. You can set it lower. Okay. And some of the greatest wine cellars in the world are as cool as like 45, 46, 47 degrees, mm -hmm. but it slows the wines aging down. It's like, you know, <clears throat> really slows the movement of the wine and the advancement of the wine down. Some right. wines that are stored at 45 uh, don't actually advance very much. And that's why uh, the, those deep cellars in London are really highly treasured in the auctions and stuff like that. And they put their wine, you know, 100, 100 uh, feet underground in these bunkers in the bottom of London and they're all stone. And 
and it's a um, it's a wonderful place to store your wine if you can get to it. But uh, for us in California, the the Amazon wine refrigerator works two out of three times. <laughs> At least they're good about replacing it. If you don't get it, they always replace it for free, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. They, yeah, their service is pretty pretty awesome. They don't want anybody to hate them. That's good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> well, uh, good to see you, David. Thank you. And Kristen, how are you? Wonderful. But I was just thinking I, I want to be invited to Nicole Brees' party because it looks like you guys are having fun over there. <laughs> yeah. Ah, this is the warm up. Christine, come on That's over. Right. Yeah. Come over at like 11. Then you're ready to get out of here. Uh, nice. That's when the pool and hot tub get going. Uh -oh. <laughs> Those people. Yeah, is it Calabasas or Westlake that you're West in? Westlake. Oh, Lake Sherwood. Yeah. Lake Sherwood. Yeah. Lake Sherwood. yeah. Nice, yeah. nice digs. Nice digs. Well, uh, Tim and Nancy, uh, where are you guys zooming in from? We're in the Mid Wilshire area, so right in the middle of town. All right, all right. And did we get you any any of the empanadas? You did, and uh, we have eaten one. <laughs> we have not. We have not had time to go back out to the uh, oven and pull the rest around. All right. And you did. Did you have the spicy potato? No, we could, we had the the one that we've had is the chili con carne. Ah, uh, cool. That's one of my favorites. Yes. And will we get a little banjo tonight? Uh, no. When I retire, I'm going to take up or resume banjo lessons. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. Left so. Well, cool. Well, good to see you all. Let's uh, take a look at what we have. If you've uh, been able to taste all three wines, I'd love for you to put in the chat box which one you prefer. And then uh, I'm going to start showing off the wines on the website and talk about pricing. Um, and anyone that's either watching this Zoom or on Facebook and, and able to uh, hear me, uh, if you go to the website, I'm going to put a crazy code up. I'm going to put it in the chat box so you can grab it. But on, on checkout of the website, if you use that code, you'll get 10% off even off of a bottle. Um, a little hint though, if you're going to buy a good amount of wine on our website, uh, you always get 10% off on 12 bottles and we can only use one code at a time. So don't use the code if you're going to get to 12 bottles because um, you're going to get the 10% automatically anyway and that will apply on any wine. But any wine on our website that uh, is in the Malbec category has that 10% off code available to you. And for those of you that are watching at home, I'm just gonna put that on the screen. I'll even blow it up for a second because it's only good for this show and it only lasts for 24 hours. Can everybody see that? I'm gonna make it big. There we go. There's the code. It's a long, I don't know. I, it must be a part of a, an algorithm or something, but that's the code that the computer spit out for me. If you can copy and paste it, you get 10% off. I'll put it in the uh, chat uh on the facebook as well and uh then you guys can see it there there comment discount code on facebook there it goes okay done so let's take a look if you guys can see you can a couple ways to get to the malbecs that we're tasting today you could go onto the event site or you could just go up to the corner of our website and hit search for Malbec. And that'll help. That'll show you every Malbec. So for what we're doing today is we're tasting these three. So I'm gonna click in from here and our Napa Valley Malbec, which isn't $200, but it also isn't $20. This is a $35 Malbec, $36 Malbec. Um, it has a suggested MSRP of around 45 um, and it is all mountain fruit. You got 92 points from Jeb Dunnick, 91 plus from Robert Parker. It does have a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, most of this fruit is coming from uh, the Howe Mountain area, um, but uh, there's quite a, quite a number of sites that they're working to source small amounts of Malbec from. And Anna makes this wine. She was the winemaker at Mount, at uh, Bryant Family and and uh, assistant winemaker at Bryant Family, and has quite a, a nice resume of other places and other people that she worked with. Places like Quintessa, Hundred Acre, 
Vineyard 29, Caldwell, Lale. So quite a nice resume and she's really, really nice. I've been able to talk to her on a Zoom before. Uh, let's go back and look at the other wines. <clears throat> the Chicana uh, Single Soil Series 2015, 37.95. It's got 92 points wine enthusiast. So pretty even um, in price point between those two. And then the Pazella Family Vineyard, 93 points. I think that's Suckling. No, that was, yeah, Suckling and Parker gave it 91. Suckling gave it 93. And this is 100% Malbec from Mendoza at $17. Now, if you've been down to Argentina, you know the power of the dollar. And that's why these price points are so different. The dollar is, um, you know, pretty powerful down there. And it, that allows people to sell this wine all the way into, import it all the way into America. And still, I sell it on this at the store with our margin. Uh, and it's still under 17 bucks. That's pretty insane. Um, so a, a really amazing effort there. Let's see which ones you like. I'm looking at the chat box. If you've got your favorites in there. Crystal liked number three the most. David liked one and two. Nicole said, oh, you that, that's because you got bottles. And we didn't blind them for you guys. Sorry about that, Nicole. The idea of blinding, it came a little bit late. Teresa Mackey, you liked one and three. Rob liked the, the, the same one as you, Nicole, the Ani which uh, the brand is called Chicana, uh, but uh, it is the any wine, yeah. Actually, it was just me that liked the uh, Chicana of oh, the group. Yeah. You separate. Nicole, Nicole can't type that. <laughs> I, I got confused. I was flipping back and forth. I see Nicole liked the Alara. Yeah, I like the Alara. And Adam, you liked the La Posta. Lori liked the La Posta. And Lisa, you got bottles also. Are you core eventing those, Lisa? Not today. I just opened up the um, biodynamic one. Okay, cool. All right. So let me just let me reveal what the other people were tasting because those of you that got tasting kits got little jars that say one, two, and three on them, and those of you that got bottles, you have no idea what we're talking about. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Wine number one, um, for those of you that got the tasting kits and a lot of people like them, wine number one was La Posta. So it's doing very well. And that's what's in my glass right now. I haven't had time to drink any of it. Solid, pretty restrained. It's not as, as powerful maybe as the others, but really balanced and delicious on a big warm day like today I, I i cooled my wines down i always encourage you to do that um some of you i might have even delivered them cold because when we sent them out we didn't know how long they'd be on the on the journey wine number two yes right in the wine fruit yeah they can deliver them i love it Really? Yeah. This is the uh, This is the Chicana and it's got a really cool label. I'm going to take my background off so my blue screen thing doesn't uh, mess with it so I can show it to you. Really um, I love the detail and the artwork and the kind of the hand drawing that's on the label. It definitely has kind of a higher end look and feel to it. So really um, enjoying both of the, these wines. I do, by the way, still have two bottles of that nine, of that uh, 2017. They got 97 points. It's a few dollars more. Uh, this one's the one that we're tasting today. The 15 is uh, 38 bucks, and the uh, 97 pointer is 42. Um, and but I, I would say they're very similar. Um, I tasted that 97 pointer about six months ago and bought it because it was good. I mean, sure, 
normally you buy it and you just you know hope they get some good press along the way uh, that one nailed that big score in decanter which is really important for uh, decanter is a really important magazine for mendoza for for malbec because the largest market for mendoza in argentina is england um, as they're not a big red wine producer they're a big red wine importer and england imports a lot of malbec especially on the higher end side they tend to buy a little well they buy both at extremes they buy more of the low end and they buy more of the high end and there's probably the stuff in the middle comes here more often but i'm digging i'm digging this wine it definitely has a unique terroir element in the nose you can smell that earthiness there's something there that's a unique presence and they tell you flat out this is grown on a unique soil uh, strata so um, that's what we're experiencing here in the nose and I think it's got a really cool perfume it's got almost like you know this granite schist kind of thing happening um, but that's calcium carbonate and I'm not a soil scientist so I don't know why that uh, presents itself the way it does. But if anybody knows, any of you um, scientists out there know what calcium carbonate would do. That would be so wine number three is the Alara, and that got a lot of uh, votes too. And I've been out with this wine a couple of times, took it to dinner, and had some really awesome feedback. We had it with some steaks, uh, one of my first time taking it out for dinner. And this is a, this was a big hit. And um, I, I will t tell you when I go out to dinner with friends, I usually bring something, you know, that's a little more dear. Um, at thirty-five bucks, this is the cheapest bottle of wine I get to take out for dinner. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about the quality, price, value here, and um, I'm selling it to some higher-end people that, you know, want a, a, a kind of a nice wow pop at that price point. That's a that's a pretty solid offering from Napa Valley, where you know you're usually spending fifty to a hundred dollars to get something of equivalent value in Cabernet. Uh, so that's what I really like about this wine, and I definitely think it's, it smells and tastes like the Napa Valley too. It's got a little bit more of that riper forwardness, and in fact, I'm going to put some in the glass right now and be able to taste it with you guys. I'd love to hear any any comments about any of the wines you guys are drinking at home. And Nicole, I'm sorry, I, I did uh, mute you guys. So if you guys want to come off mute. Um, Probably appropriately so. <laughs> sorry about that. No, you guys are good. We love the energy. Bring it. <laughs> the Napa to me, right at because I got the bottles, but I, you know, did the pour bin thing. And then I kind of wrote on my glasses, which was which, so it was, was kind of a blind. Um, the rat right of the box, the Napa, I like better, but the other ones, I guess, as it's gone on, they opened up for me a little bit more. I liked them a little more. Cool. Yeah, the Napa is pretty showy. Um, off the, out of the get, out, right out of the bottle, and um, I do think that that, <clears throat> that earthiness that you're getting from the Argentine wines is a little bit, you know, that's pr pretty typical for the Napa Valley. We usually see fruit first. And that's part of our terroir is that sunshine factor. And in, in Mendoza, they can have some serious terroir. And that's why so many Europeans are going there. And I really think number two, the, uh, <clears throat> the wine uh, Ani is really, um, you know, showing that rocky minerality. And that's just right in play with what a European winemaker would be looking for, unless they're looking for cash and they're trying to sell it to the U.S. market, which love, we love our fruit here. But um, I think it kind of plays in both worlds. It's got new world and old world aspects to it. And um, there's certainly a, a, a nice track record in Mendoza of these wines aging really well, especially when they're built like this. I'm not talking about the nine and ten dollar Malbecs. I'm talking about you know the serious ones, and these guys are are serious. They're they do own a lot of land. They sell off most of their fruit, but the small amount of wine that they make is meant to kind of set the high bar, and so they're one of the uh, more interesting um, high ethos brands 
in the in the Argentine marketplace. I buy from a really reputable importer of high ethos wines. Um, the Pizella is delicious and a screaming deal, less than twenty dollars. It is um, often found in in pretty large quantities here in in, in the United States. Katana family has great marketing and great sales team here in California. And so you'll see their wines at all price points and all levels in different places. This wine, probably one of the least uh, distributed because it is kind of meant to be sold to restaurants and they want to show this wine off by the glass in restaurants. So there's a big incentive for restaurants to buy it. Um, and that's where I got to taste it and I decided to bring it into our store and uh, is, is a, a true value, true value. Um, there's a lot of Argentine Malbecs that I frankly don't like. Um, anything that's super inexpensive is inexpensive for a reason and probably didn't come from a super high reputable vineyard nor did it see ever see a wood barrel. Um, they would put them in stainless steel and and just sell them for a lot less money. They're very tinny and thin and sure they look dark, but in the mouth they just don't have much substance to them. And I think all of these avoid that. I think the Pazella is a little lighter in texture, but you're kind of getting what you're paying for there. If you get up to, a, you know, if you start going north of $25 with an Argentine Malbec, you really get this incredible increase in volume in the mouth. Um, if you want to look for something like that from us, um, I love the wines from Caro, uh, also a Katana winery, but it's Katana and Rothschild. It's one of their partnerships. So we have the Caro wines and uh, in particular, and I'll just show the website of a couple that I've got. Again, just going to Malbec in the search makes this pretty easy. Um, and I'll come back to some of these, but uh, from Caro, we have their Aruma, which is just their straight Malbec, almost at a similar price point to the La Posta, a little light of that. But Caro is one of the brands that caught my imagination first. Again, this Katana and Rothschild. And this wine right here is really a significant deal um, oh no, I'm looking at the wrong one. This one is what I'm looking for, Amankaya. Amankaya is from Caro and this is their blend. It's 50 Cab and 50 Malbec. And this wine is always just a drop dead, gorgeous wine. And basically it's kind of like half of their uh, Malbec wine and then half of their reserve. Their, their high end wine is called, their high end wine is Caro by Caro. And um, this is a $60 bottle of wine and it's outstanding. And it's the, this is the wine that I met my wife uh, over which on our first date. I took her out for dinner to a really good Argentine steakhouse in Los Angeles called Carlitos Gardel. And uh, Maximiliano, the, the owner son, the, he operates the restaurant there. He's also the Somme. We're looking through the wine list and I saw O2 Caro, this is 10 years ago, and I saw O2 and I said, oh, that's got some nice age to it. That looks good. I've always heard about that one, never tasted it before. He goes, you'll love it. We did love it. And we, in fact, went out after our first date and we left and we were talking about the wine all night. We loved it so much that both of us the next day got on the phone and tried to find it. Well, I got on the phone a second earlier and was on the phone with this company up in Napa Valley that had a case. They were the only ones that had this O2 Caro. And um, I bought it and she was on the other line trying to buy the same case. And they let her know that someone on the other line bought the case of wine before she did. And she was upset and didn't know it was me. And I surprised her the next time I saw her with a bottle of O2 Caro and told her I got the case. So uh, that's, uh, that's one of our wines. Um, so I've carried a lot of different vintages of Caro on the website and I've bought even more O2 over time. It's still drinking like a champion. 
and uh, probably have a little too much O2 now, so I, I may even put some of it on the website. But I have O2, O6, O9, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that wine. It's made with that Lafitte, uh, well, well, you know, Lafitte owns their own French forest, and so they use their Lafitte French wood that they put on their Chateau Lafitte wine, and they use that 100% new on the Caro, so it's pretty dynamic and um, it's built to withstand that type of wood as well and it gets a pretty high price point because of it well that's our uh, little talk and walk through malbec um, you know the idea of having empanadas is a good time any day of the week um, i sent each of you a couple of recipe ideas and stuff like that in the email um, but if you ever go to World Empanadas, just tell them that you learned about them from us here at uh, Wine LA. Can't promise that they'll give you anything extra, but they might give you a handshake or a pat on the back. But uh, they, uh, they're, it's a good little family operation. Mom, dad, and the son are all there working really hard, probably a little too hard. Um, they would be on the video tonight, but they've, this is their busiest night of the week, and they've got a line around the block right now. Uh, and they can't find anybody to come and work for them at uh, 15, 20 bucks an hour either. So they're working overtime and a little grumpy. Hey, these empanadas are so good. Oh, right. I'm yeah. glad you like it. Yeah, the flavor is really good. Yeah, that, and I, I, I don't know which one I like the best. I kind of like having different ones, uh, you know, one... You know, I think Tim, did we send you the assorted pack? Who, me? Uh, Tim and Nancy got the assorted pack. We did, and it, it wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> but, and we have, we've only really eaten two so far. All right. So, they were good. We ordered yeah. late, so we yes, got a we, grab we, bag. <laughs> yep, we got what was Sorry, left. guys, you did. No. You, I, I, I'm lucky I bought as many as I did because I, I, we keep them in the freezer um, like around all month long. We'll go once a month and buy a bunch for the freezer. If we're working hard and we get home, we'll just make a, a batch of empanadas and a salad for dinner and that'll, uh, that'll have to do. But uh, they are uh, pretty tasty and uh, they're good people. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys like them and thank you for supporting the Zoom tonight. We have uh, um, our upcoming Zooms are currently on the Zoom Into Wine website, which is supposed to be right here. So I'm just going to flip over there and show you guys what we got coming up. Next Wednesday, I'm doing a biodynamic session with Chateau Maris in France. And the owner of Chateau Maris is talking to me on Monday, and we're going to record with him. But this is uh, this is just a really cool brand. They say there's there's organic and there's biodynamic wineries, and then there's Chateau Maris, because these guys are so crazy about it. Um, next uh, month in July, uh, we we move to a Wednesday Thursday session, and uh, in fact on Thursday next week I'm double duty. I have a six o'clock beekeeper tasting which I do the first Thursday of every month at six o'clock. And we're gonna be tasting the 2017 Beekeeper Secret Stones. And then at seven o'clock, I do this bubble session. We'll do Prosecco, some French, nice French bubbles, and then a bottle of champagne and really talk about how they're each different. And uh, the, the, the $50 ticket is quite a deal. You get a half bottle of Tattinger, a full bottle of J.O. Prosecco, and a full bottle of the Café de Paris. So uh, you might want to check that one out. There's also a full bottle of Tattinger opportunity there too. Unfortunately, my, my session with the Brown Estate had to get rescheduled. We were on the wrong date and they uh, double booked. So we moved them out to August. So that'll reappear in August. And it's just coming a little too fast to replace it. So we're just going to take that night off and move to the 8th where we do a really fun session on Chenin Blanc, which has been one of our best performing grapes over the last year. And I'm doing a full, pers you know, kind of a collective approach here. One of my favorite little wines from the Loire Valley made right outside of Sauvignere. 
something from California, from one of the oldest Chenin Blanc vineyards in California, a classic Vouvray, and a really nice bottle of Steen from uh, South Africa. So we'll have a pretty neat perspective. And then my friend, Chef Bob Blummer, we're gonna do a thing on salmon. We're really trying to get Copper River salmon. We're waiting just a few more days to say Copper River on the, on the event. I'm not going to be uh, sending Copper River salmon around town. Everybody can get it at the store, Whole Foods down the street. But if you want to get a piece of salmon, Bob will talk you through cooking the salmon. And Chef Bob Blummer is on the Food Network. He's a, a multi-award winning cookbook author. And we've got four awesome wines. Because when I got Bob on there, and I know he's a wine lover, he ultimately is doing this to help me. He's a good friend of mine. And so I got to make sure the wines are super cool for Bob because Bob loves good wine. So I put some really awesome juice behind that class. And this is kind of our new business model going forward as we took the shipping price out of the tasting kits. Um, uh, the tasting kits will, every shipment now in, starting in July will be $10 in California but we'll have a little bit lighter pricing and the 12 bottle discount will more than pay for the shipping. So that's where we gotta go because our even our um, courier service is trying to double the rate of our delivery. So um, we're going to a $10 shipping model and if you're a member of Zoom Into Wine, you're gonna get a free delivery um, as a member once a month. So it's another way to reward our membership. And, but you're also gonna get rewarded with a lighter price on the Zoom. So we'll do this Zoom for 25 bucks to kind of kick things off. You'll get a sample of each of the wines and then it's gonna be $10 delivery on top of that. I was looking through his cookbook this, this morning. My girlfriend's, come, a friend of mine's coming over for dinner tomorrow. And I think I'm making a salmon burger that I think he did quite a few months ago with you, right? Yeah, he, and, and you're going to love that sound. Yeah, I got that book, yeah. Yeah, it's, he's, I mean, all of his stuff is super good. Um, one of our, our favorite entertainment things to do, he makes a whole bunch of fun appetizers too in one of his older cookbooks. It's literally shrimp on the Barbie, and it is a Barbie doll covered in shrimp, and it just knocks everybody out. Uh, so he has uh, some really good ideas for catering and stuff like that. And he's just a total problem solver. And uh, he just shot his own movie. He might be getting a little too big for us pretty soon. Um, I've always said that he's like Anthony Bourdain um, and without the drug problem. And he is just uh, super, super on it. And and uh, he's I think his uh, star is about to rise. So... Uh, come uh, hang out with Bob Blummer. You're going to love him, and we're going to drink some great wine. And he's going to even take you through uh, some steps to kind of avoid the pitfalls of overcooking salmon and making making it dry it out and things like that. So he's got a lot of tips for us. All right, back into our uh, little menu. And I'm sorry my commercial's going a lot longer than I normally like it to go. A lot to talk about this time. I haven't Zoomed for a little while. We took a kind of a little bit of a... Uh, we've done a lot of our big programs with the STARS events, but there haven't been a lot of Zooms recently. Um, <clears throat> so we got a lot to talk about. This we're, I'm doing my, my Spanish finds. I, if you like wines of Spain, I've got so many cool wines from Spain right now. I just don't know where to stop. And uh, so I put a collection of them together. Albarino, Godello, this little Cune, Rioja, that's only $15, just like one of the best little house wines you could find this super cool Monsant, and uh we're going over to these this the, the king of old vine grenache uh with emilio moro um i'm gonna i'm working with uh, uh well i don't want to say this the wrong way i'm not working with the hollywood bowl i'm actually a concert freak and i buy a season tickets at the hollywood bowl and um, I will go see anyone. I'm not even a big Christina Aguilera fan, but I do love a lot of her songs. And she is the first concert that's coming up at the Hollywood Bowl. So I bought a bunch of tickets and I'm encouraging people to come out and hang out with me. If you buy tickets to this show with, Chris, with Christina Aguilera, I'm having a little champagne welcome. 
and you can buy the tickets for me to go and see the show which is probably now sold out my tickets are going to be a steal because i'm not really a scalper i just love having good people at the concert with me and so if you want to go see christina aguilera i've got some decent seats they're not in the boxes they're just uh affordable and um i've got a nice little group together and we'll do a little champagne then walk in and see the show and that'll be fun and i'm going to do that a couple of times this summer i've got a, a just a killer tasting not all my tastings are super low end uh, this one is going to be, I call it beast mode. It's Rhone versus Roussillon and uh, four just knockout wines that you have to kind of get into and learn about and hear about. And if you just, get, you know, hear the story of Chen Bleu, um, the story of Domaine Thivian Calvet, um, it is, these guys are like, the superstars that no one's ever heard of before big scores hard to get wines really really awesome we do the same thing with Beaujolais at the end of the month really good Beaujolais by the way not the cheap stuff we're going to Piedmont Italy love for you to come with me we've got uh I'm not sure why that's showing up right there but Piedmont's in November uh we're going it's basically uh the first week of December if you could go to Piedmont click on this box and find out all about our trip to Piedmont. We're only going with 10 people and it's all about truffles and Barolo. And then here's our concert with her. Uh, this is a show that I'm really excited about. This, this girl is absolutely incredibly talented and I've got some really good tickets for the show with her. Also sold out now at this time, I've been told. So that's our upcoming lineup. And uh, I want to thank you guys for joining me tonight. And hopefully I'll see you more often. We have uh, more coming down the pipe to announce. And we're working on a lot of fun stuff. So stay in touch and uh, drink well, my friends. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye now.